Hello and welcome back to the Clinical Research Consortium. I'm Len Matheson with Epic Rehab. As a reminder to students and researchers, at the end of this video will be important references. Today's presentation is part one of the history of SWAGs or structured work activity groups. Modern design criteria for SWAGs began to be developed at Rancho Los Amigos National Rehabilitation Center in Downey, California in 1975. SWAG is a method of demand structured work simulation used in work capacity evaluation. Each SWAG provides a suite of demand structured work tasks within the context of a simulated work environment. Over the years, SWAGs have followed a securitist development path that began at Rancho. In 1975, a new state law mandated vocational rehabilitation services for people who had become disabled as a result of a workers' compensation injury. Rancho is a 212-acre facility in Downey, California, a suburb of Los Angeles. For many years, Rancho had been the Los Angeles County poor farm, where homeless people would go to live and grow their own food and raise their own livestock until they could get back on their feet. In the early 1950s, the polio epidemic transformed Rancho into a major rehabilitation center. As a teaching and research hospital affiliated with the University of Southern California School of Medicine, Rancho helped to develop many effective polio rehabilitation tools and technologies. In the 1960s, as medical research made it possible for people with other serious neurological conditions, including spinal cord injuries, serious brain injuries, and strokes, to be able to benefit from rehabilitation, Rancho became one of America's leading medical rehabilitation centers with more than 1,200 patient beds and 30,000 outpatients. One of the major innovations at Rancho was the development of the interdisciplinary team approach to rehabilitation. I had the wonderful opportunity to become a very junior member of a Rancho interdisciplinary team in 1970 and spent the first 10 years of my career being mentored by generous and brilliant healthcare professionals. One of the first things that they taught me was the stage model of rehabilitation. In this eight-stage model, professional responsibilities are shared with a gradually shifting focus of responsibility as a person moves from being a patient to being a client and eventually returns to full-fledged participation in their family, at work, and in their community. The first stage in the interdisciplinary team model that we used at Rancho addressed pathology. Stage two addressed impairment. Stage three addressed functional limitations. Stage four addressed occupational disability. Stage 5 addressed vocational feasibility. Stage 6 addressed employability. Stage 7 addressed vocational handicap. And Stage 8 addressed earning capacity. There are other videos in this series that focus in on the stage model and can provide you with additional information. We developed our first structured work simulations and as part of the interdisciplinary team's need to improve the effectiveness of services focused at stage four, occupational disability. Most of the developmental work that we did was undertaken at the Rancho Work Preparation Center. Developed by Dr. Carolyn Vash and Dr. Brian Kemp, this was a large 12,000 square foot facility where we developed functional capacity evaluation, work capacity evaluation, and work hardening in the mid 1970s. As part of our efforts to help people get back to work after a serious injury or illness, we developed several tools that continue to be in use today. For example, the Physical Demand Characteristics, or PDC, chart was developed at the Work Preparation Center. The PDC chart extended the five-level United States Department of Labor system for categorizing the strength demands of a job into an eight-level model that was useful as people transitioned through rehabilitation. We also added the energy expenditure levels, or MET levels, that are used in the PDC chart today. Additional information about the PDC chart is available in other videos on this channel. At Rancho, we had excellent relationships with employers throughout Los Angeles. As we assisted people to return to work, employers helped us to develop a method to confirm their readiness for employment. Additional information about the FEC is available in other videos on this channel. One of my mentors at Rancho was Dr. Harry Rice, a cardiologist who developed tremendous expertise in dealing with people who had chronic disabling angina pain. Harry led a team that did some of the early work on the efficacy of coronary artery bypass graft surgery, a team on which I worked as the psychologist. 
One of our early interventions was to quantify the severity of anginal pain in order to help people develop a sense of self-efficacy about symptom control. We taught our patients a numerical rating system to guide their self-monitoring. Another one of my mentors at Rancho was Dr. Vert Mooney, an orthopedic spinal surgeon with tremendous expertise in dealing with chronic and disabling spinal pain. As a method to address this problem that was informed by our earlier experience in cardiac rehabilitation with the numerical rating angina pain system, the Symptom Productivity Index was developed. This is a 10-level rating system that we taught our clients at the Work Preparation Center to guide their self-monitoring so that they could develop a sense of self-efficacy about symptom control. Additional information about the Symptom Productivity Index is available in other videos on this channel. Another important area of innovation at the Rancho Work Preparation Center was the development of work capacity evaluation devices, of which SWAGs are the most recent innovation. I want to present one of these devices to you today, but before I do, I need to provide you with a tool that we're going to use in this video to help organize our thinking. Let's talk about the test factors hierarchy that we developed at Rancho. This is based on guidelines provided by the American Psychological Association and the American Industrial Hygiene Association. These professional groups address the factors necessary to consider as we develop tests and other methods of evaluation. These factors guide the psychometric appraisal of such instruments. The development of any test or method of evaluation begins with consideration of safety. Problems with safety and the perception of safety will interfere with all of the other factors in the hierarchy. The next level up in the hierarchy focuses on reliability. Reliability has to do with the dependability of the data that are collected. There are three major components of reliability. The first has to do with the reliability of the test and test equipment. The second has to do with the reliability of the evaluator who administers the test. The third has to do with the reliability of the evaluee who is participating in the test. Problems with reliability will interfere with the subsequent factors in the hierarchy. The next level in the hierarchy focuses on validity. The validity of a test or other method of evaluation has to do with the applicability of the data. Validity is a synthesis of the information that is collected and how it is interpreted. The interpretation of the information is used to make a decision about what to do next. Issues that challenge validity will affect subsequent factors in the hierarchy. The next level in the hierarchy focuses on practicality. The practicality of a test or other method of evaluation has to do with the time and expense and effort required to collect the data. The final level in the hierarchy focuses on utility. This has to do with whether or not the information is useful. Does the information collected in the test or other evaluation procedure tell you what to do next? If the safety and reliability and validity and practicality of the test have been adequately addressed, you will have useful information on what to do next. And so, with the test factors hierarchy in mind, let's take a look at an early work capacity evaluation device developed at the Rancho Work Preparation Center. Our experience with this device provided some of the foundational work on the swags that we use today. This is the Watson Sally Port. George Watson was our primary developer of work capacity evaluation devices. I had the distinct opportunity to be mentored by George as an early research subject on the devices that he developed. Whenever George got ready to put a device into clinical practice, he usually called on me to test it out and give him feedback. I hope that you will forgive the poor quality of the next several pictures. These are almost 50 years old. I'll do my best to explain what we're looking at. What we see here is a small version of a pipe corral, such as you would find on a ranch or farm. Assembly of a pipe corral was a common task in an agricultural setting. More importantly, the physical demands of a pipe corral assembly were similar to many other tasks, such as those found in the construction trades. What we see here is a young man we'll call Frank, assemble the pipe corral. Frank is a construction carpenter who is one of Dr. Mooney's patients, temporarily disabled from work due to a back injury. The pipe corral is constructed out of two-inch steel pipe. There are 12 pieces that are 10 feet long, eight pieces that are three feet long, eight pieces that are 26 inches long, and four pieces that are 10 inches long. The pipe and the fittings are held on the rack behind Frank. He retrieves the pipe and fittings necessary from the rack and is assembling them on the floor of the work preparation center. In this next slide, Frank continues to assemble the pipe corral. The weight of the steel pipe ranges from 3 pounds for the 10 inch long sections 
up to 36 pounds for the 10 foot long sections. Working with such loads in a continuous standing and walking task places Frank in the light medium physical demand characteristics level. In addition to evaluating the strength demands of work, the pipe corral assembly process allows us to evaluate other physical demands, including standing, walking, reaching, bending, and carrying. As we watch Frank perform this task, we can also pick up some other information that we would classify as work function themes. We collected information about Frank's body mechanic safety, his pacing of his approach to this task, and his whole body range of motion. Because we are collecting so much information, Frank's performance is videotaped for later review. Issues that were identified on the videotape were reviewed with Frank to provide him with guidance about how to improve his work performance. As you think back over the last few slides, I'm sure that you'll agree that Frank has some issues with body mechanic safety that he needs to address. Along with the video recording, we developed methods of behavioral observation and a performance rating checklist for this work capacity evaluation device. These rating scales are crucial, providing the primary means of data collection. The client's productivity, safety, and interpersonal behavior are the focus of the feasibility evaluation checklist that I describe in other videos on this channel. So how did Frank do and how did we do? Did his participation in this work simulation provide us with useful information? And the answer is yes, it did. We got good information about Frank's ability to perform his work and what he would need to improve upon to return to work safely as a construction carpenter. But are there test factor concerns that we can identify? And the answer is yes. Certainly, we notice problems with safety. Safety in work capacity evaluation depends on the interface of the person's functional limitations with the job's demands. The basic safety question of whether the work capacity divided by the work demand is greater than 1.0 was answered for Frank in the negative. He did not have adequate work capacity to meet the work demands of a construction carpenter. An important part of our feedback to Frank had to do with his body mechanics. In particular, we worked with Frank to use his legs rather than his spine to perform work tasks at different heights and over the wide range of vertical lifts that are required in his job as a construction carpenter. Without putting Frank in this work simulation, it would be difficult to find out how much a problem this is for Frank. Subsequent review of the videotape at his exit interview really helped Frank and his rehabilitation case manager appreciate this before he went into our work hardening program. Authorization for the work hardening program greatly depended on review of the videotape of this work capacity evaluation performance. The Sally Port also had some test factor concerns about reliability. For the Sally Port, the concern about evaluator consistency could only be addressed by having George Watson be the evaluator of every client, which just is not practical. So George developed a simple set of procedures and put together an orientation program for the rest of us so that we could do a reasonably good job maintaining consistency across evaluators and across clients. But an issue that we had a lot of difficulty addressing was whether or not the evaluee was putting forth full effort. It wasn't so much a problem with Frank, but it is an open issue with many clients who have work disability. We had to do better than what the Sally Port allowed us to do in this regard. Although the Sally Port provided us with valid information, it also presented a test factors concern in terms of practicality. Rehabilitation clinics rarely have 12,000 square feet within which to work. The amount of time required for the task was also a concern. Space and time are both practicality concerns. The Watson Sally Port required about 225 square feet plus the distance required to place the video camera to collect information as the evaluee worked around the project. The usual assembly plus disassembly time was 180 minutes. Keep in mind that you've always got to include disassembly. And so, although we did have utility with the Watson Sally Port, providing us with valid information that we could use to guide Frank's rehabilitation, we also had important test factor concerns about safety, reliability, and practicality. To address the safety concerns, we instituted a functional capacity evaluation pre-screening using what eventually became the West Standard Evaluation to address lift capacity and potential issues with biomechanics that could present safety challenges. I address these in other videos.
you might want to subscribe to this channel so that you can be notified when these are available. To address the reliability concerns, in addition to the written instructions that George provided, we developed a behavioral observation checklist that standardized our data collection. Together, these were the backbone of the professional orientation that we provided to new evaluators. Standardization of observational data collection has become a mainstay of modern rehab. Now, here is the most important part of this lesson that has to do with SWAGs, or Structured Work Activity Groups. The professional judgments that are possible with SWAGs depend on reliable collection of observational data followed by valid interpretation of the data. This process got started as I was working with cardiac rehab patients at Rancho in 1973, helping them get back to work. More about this in other videos. On the cardiac team, I was the psychologist and also responsible for interfacing between the physicians and the employers as our patients tried to return to work. But physicians and patients and employers all needed to communicate using the same language. It wasn't useful to the employer to hear that Mr. Smith's SD segment depression was now normal. It wasn't meaningful to the patient to hear that angina could be used as a safety signal. It wasn't helpful to the physician to hear that Mr. Smith's job was at the medium PDC level. SD segments and safety signals and PDC levels were gibberish to people from the outside. Basically, we had to bridge the gap between employers and physicians so that patients who were becoming clients could cross the bridge, go back to work, and take care of their families. So, as a psychologist who was really interested in measuring things, I came up with three new tools that proved to be useful to bridge the gap. I developed the eight-level PDC chart with typical energy expenditures to extend the Department of Labor job analysis system into the clinical environment. I developed the Symptom Productivity Index with 10 levels of symptom recording and a cut point for employability. I developed the concept of feasibility for employment along with a simple eight-point checklist to measure employment feasibility. This is the genesis of the DCAT employability rating guidelines and situational assessment record. We'll get to both of these later in this series on the history of the SWAGs. Other video lessons are available for the PDC chart and the Symptom Productivity Index. What you see here is the first version of the feasibility evaluation checklist that we use to communicate between physicians and employers in the cardiac rehab program at Rancho. As you can see, it's pretty simple. The first four factors operationalize productivity based on quantity, quality, attendance, and workplace tolerance. The next two factors operationalize safety based on adherence to safety rules and protective behavior. The safety rules variable is self-evident, but the protective behavior variable is not. Let me explain it. It came about because we had a client who precipitated a myocardial infarction and almost died at work because he was a risk taker. His employer had to be convinced that he had learned his lesson and could come back to the plant. As we started to collect data on this particular variable for him, we realized it was not an infrequent problem and went ahead and added it to the feasibility evaluation checklist. The last two factors came about because most of our people returned to work with angina pain. That was the point of our rehab program. We were still exploring the efficacy of coronary artery bypass surgery. We were randomizing patients in a research study into exercise versus surgery for treatment of their anginal pain. In the exercise group, the primary dynamic had to do with the relationship between pain and productivity. Working with angina pain can be accomplished safely and dependably, but it takes getting used to calibrating symptoms versus effort. Some people who have difficulty with supervisors would have angina as a consequence of interpersonal stress that may not have anything to do with the work output, thus the need for accept direction as a variable. Other people couldn't be healthfully selfish and maintain a work pace that was safe for themselves when they were working on a team or they were just not fit enough to keep up with their teammates. Before firefighters were mandatorily retired for coronary artery disease, they were good examples of this particular problem. 
when we adapted the cardiac feasibility evaluation checklist for use with the sally port with people like Frank, this is what we came up with. We added two new variables that reflected the broader range of patients at the Work Preparation Center at Rancho. Beyond working with folks with cardiac problems or stroke problems or brain injuries, we started to do a lot of work with people who were disabled by chronic musculoskeletal pain. Many of these people had been out of work for two or three years, struggling with chronic back pain or failed back surgery. They were people like Frank, whose behaviors were intimately involved with their symptoms, and their symptoms were interfering with their ability to work. So, body mechanics became an obvious focus of our work with these people. This also began to draw our attention to ergonomics beyond looking only at the energy demands of work. The biomechanical demands and postural demands of work started to be a focus as well. I joined the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society and began participating in local and national meetings and working on ergonomic certification for occupational therapists and physical therapists. The addition of the adjusting to different supervisors variable was brought about because most of our patients continued to have pain as they returned to work and needed to be advocates for themselves. This was a new and difficult transition for many people, especially blue collar workers in unionized employment settings. Many, but not all employers would tell us, I don't want him back unless he's 100% cleared to do everything. Of course, that made it very difficult before the advent of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which does not solve all of these problems, but at least gives us an opportunity to talk about reasonable accommodation. But some of the employers really wanted to have a skilled worker return to employment, at least at the corporate level. Problems arose when supervisors out on the floor or in the field learned that Mr. Smith was returning to work in spite of his symptoms. Rather than looking at this as a heroic attempt by a dedicated worker, which is how corporate saw it, Mr. Smith's supervisors often saw this as an imposition on them. So, we worked with our clients to identify the accommodations that were necessary for them and then help them become effective advocates for themselves. We would also implement the adaptations in the work hardening program at Rancho and send the client to work with those same adaptations. This required that we purchase these and fabricate the adaptations in the clinic, which we did quite frequently. We were usually reimbursed by the insurance carrier, but even if we weren't reimbursed, many of the accommodations were quite inexpensive. The point was that the client showing up at work on the first day had everything he or she needed to do the job. This made it much more likely that the supervisor would be minimally inconvenienced. With this approach, many of our pain-disabled patients who continue to have symptomatic response to work activities went back to work with pain. More about this in other video lessons. I like to point out that many of these variables have important cognitive components that are also pertinent to people with different types of brain impairment. Quantity of productivity and the amount of dependable work output is usually an important temporary variable early in return to work after a concussion or other brain injury. The mental fatigue that brain injured clients experience needs to be anticipated when they return to work. We wouldn't send anybody back to work after a brain injury without having at least a four hour workplace tolerance because that gives us something to work on. For people who were required to work an eight hour workday, we would carefully script a mid morning and lunch break to include a serious rest. I made it mandatory for my brain injured clients returning to work to take a 20 minute adenosine nap at lunchtime. I still do that today. Obviously, the quality of dependable work output is an important issue for a person with cognitive impairment. It's actually pretty similar to the problems that a person has with chronic disabling pain, causing distraction and inability to maintain adequate error control. Brain injuries creating problems with attention and concentration lead to poor quality control, which is even more important to employers than limited quantity of productivity. Catching and correcting errors is much more expensive than simply working more slowly on an error-free basis. This orientation of employers is very difficult for people with brain injuries to fully appreciate and is a frequent cause of termination after returning to work. 
Brain injured clients with executive dysfunction having to do with emotional and behavioral control often have difficulty with being corrected by their supervisors on the job. Most supervisors forget that the returning worker with an invisible disability like a brain injury is not the same person they effectively corrected three months earlier by being sarcastic or yelling at them. I've had several clients get into verbal and occasionally physical altercations with supervisors because of this. Related issues with response to interpersonal disruption as a consequence of executive dysfunction were also a concern of ours as we evaluated people in the Sally Port and with our other workstations and work capacity evaluation devices at Rancho. We made it a point to start with each of our cognitively impaired clients working alone with the least demanding supervisor. We gradually increased the occupational demand for that person by moving the cognitively impaired person to a team project and eventually to our most demanding supervisor to see if we could elicit a constructive failure experience. More about that in other video lessons. We had had enough experience with return to work failures due to these two interpersonal issues that we wanted to see if we could elicit them at the work preparation center at Rancho. Once elicited, we would help the client develop more self-awareness and better self-control strategies. We also worked with the rehabilitation counselor and employer to try to pave the way to a reasonably accommodated interpersonal work environment. This is able to be achieved with a motivated employer who has continued to be interested in a former employee's return. For this reason, we had pre-vocational counselors who did their best to make contact with employers while the person was still hospitalized as a patient and then keep the employer informed as the person progressed through rehabilitation as a client on his way to going back to work. I don't think this happens very much anymore, which is a pity. Pre-vocational counseling was an effective strategy to keep employers involved in rehab at Rancho and other rehabilitation settings in the 1970s and 1980s. So we started developing the feasibility evaluation checklist at Rancho in 1973. It has birthed many observational instruments, including the rating scales we use for the SWAGs. Here is the DCAT situational assessment record. This is what we use to record observational data as a client goes through the DCAT situational assessment. Case studies on how to use this are available in other video lessons. But many of the other test factor concerns were difficult to address at Rancho because we were limited by equipment that could be purchased or simply fabricated. What we really needed was a design engineer and sophisticated fabrication capability. So, after going as far as we could at Rancho, the next step in the SWAG development path led to the founding of a small company called Work Evaluation Systems Technology. Known by the acronym WEST, this company involved Clifford Lang and Stephen Babala and me in the development of tools that could be used across a broader range of rehabilitation facilities and medical clinics. Our first service delivery site was the Casa Kalina Hospital for Rehabilitation Medicine. Swag development work that was accomplished by West at Casa Kalina is the focus of our next video in this series. So, thank you for trusting us with your time. I hope that this was worth your while. Please let us know any questions that you may have so that we can improve future videos. In the meantime, please subscribe to this channel so that we can alert you to additional offerings. And now, for students and researchers, are two useful references.